I had proposed in a paper that I listed there that if we're doing research on a big project, we should be looking at the things that don't change so quickly over time. That we are better spending our time on the subject variables. How do different people interact with the technology? Whether they're volunteer translators with no training in translation at all, or whether they're extremely experienced. Uh, whether or not they've got prior training in the area. I'm very interested in looking at different workflows with different groups of revision, review, volunteers, and the way the TM impacts on those different work environments. And that's something that doesn't change over five or ten years. You know, how are professionals going to work with volunteers, for example? And you know, time pressure interests me, but time pressure is always there. It's not a five or ten year thing. And then you get into What's the effect on different text types? But there are so many text types, it's so hard to define a text type. But I, I tend not to want to lose myself there. Different translation instructions, you can do that. The current pairing of different programs don't go there because they won't be around long enough. Types of memories don't bother. Languages and directionality is just a mess. And it's the little things there, the minor things. Tend not to help us. Our preference, I suggest, should be for the things at the top of that list because of the degree of generalization we need and the uh, time scale of our research. These are the things we can do. Very important here the interviews, post translation interviews, uh, not just what people do, but what they think they do and how they feel about it is quite important. I want to give you a quick telegrammatic report of what people have found so far, okay? 2005, in the United Kingdom, only 28% of professionals use any TM system at all. And I've had our colleagues here tell me TMs is not really used in the profession. 2006, ah, oh, and very widely between novice translators and seasoned translators. Guess who used TMs more? Novices. It's just the sociology of new technology coming in. 2006, same year, Lagudaki, Imperial College, London, 82.5% of respondents used TMs. What? How can you explain? <laughs> 28%? A lot of people in one year suddenly picked up. Okay, um, it's just like the toothpaste surveys, you know, 9 out of 10 doctors would recommend it. <laughs> you ask all the doctors or the dentists. Um, like the Ducky did a survey on the localization industry. Within localization, extremely high. In the general market, extremely low. Okay, so. Uh, which platform works? Uh, Carlotta Rivas. Uh, found no significant difference. Crowd on stationary, 2007. Yeah. That was it. Forget about that one. <laughs> Do the experiment. Six students, nothing different. Nah. <laughs> Move on to something else. Uh, who did this? Uh, event. Now, all the companies used to claim that productivity increases. In fact, Trados was called a productivity tool. It will enable you to produce more translation in less time. That's what they mean by productivity, okay? And it's found that that doesn't always happen. So the combination here of TM and MT, but also just for, 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 for travel, only increases productivity if translators are comfortable with their new role as post-editors of machine control translations. This very early, this is when machine translation was really rough, Okay. Uh, but I think it's still very, very interesting. If people don't want to use the new technology and the company makes them use it, they have a sort of strike reaction, they go slow. You know, I'm not happy with this, I don't want to use this, and so it doesn't work for them. It, 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 the job satisfaction is lower and their productivity doesn't increase. 
The translation service in the European Union adopted Trados, as it's been there for about 10 years now, as a productivity tool. But the cost of translations in the European Union have not declined. It's supposed to be a productivity tool. It hasn't. I can see the official statistics. Um, and now, the TMs are marketed as a way of controlling translation, of standardizing terminology, which they do. Okay, so the discourse of productivity is sort of not laid on quite so much. And not a lot of evidence is found from productivity games. This goes in what we thought before. Um, this is still in a phrase of TM, oh, just a second thought. TM matches are useful for experienced translators. Contextualized by text are more useful for novices. They found that uh, experienced translators would use the match for terminology. Okay, they would pick it up and they say, oh yeah, that's the term. That's the one I use. That's the one I'm looking for. We'd be like using a dictionary to jog your memory. Yeah? Whereas the novices would go and dig around. I don't know, it, you can get the previous match and then click and go into the previous context the text around the match you're interested in. And novices would do that more as a learning experience. They want to know, know more about the language. And of course, as soon as they do that, their productivity sinks. Because the tool gives them too much information uh, for productivity to be true. So interestingly, they found two quite different ways of using the information given by the tool. This is the travels early. It's Dragstead, but it's just a doctoral thesis and a very good one too. Um, professionals spend less time, uh, more time on revising when they use a TM, which is good. We would expect them to do that. Okay, they're aware. They're not as, as confident of the result. Okay, it's Dragstead again. Her thesis was explicitly on segmentation. What effect does a segmentation have on the way people work? Uh, she's looking at Trados. Trados basically uses a sentence as a segmentation unit, full stops. And she pointed out, she did eye tracking, and she could see the way translators segment a text naturally, okay, and then the way they segment when they're using Trados. And it's obvious that the sentence is not always a relative unit, a pertinent unit when you're out of that environment. You could be working on one phrase a lot, or you could need the whole paragraph to solve a, a certain cohesion problems. Um, but she found that the more professional, the more experience the translators had, the more significant the sentence was. Just plain strange. There was a, a, a sort of standardization. Novices would zoom in and zoom out, spend a lot of time looking around different contexts, different degrees of text, to make a decision. Whereas professionals just plow through the text. Give me that sentence solved, give me the next sentence solved, give me the next sentence solved. They go faster in their drafting process because of it. And this strangely suggested that the more professional translators segment the text in a way similar to what Trados does. Is that why professionals rely more on the editing process to maybe compensate for that? They do spend more time on revising, which is what we find there. Okay. And um, work by Jakobsen showed that they spend more time than novices on revising and make fewer changes because they're more confident. Okay. Professionalism, what is it? It's experience, but especially its confidence in, in, in your decisions. Because they have more confidence, they don't fish around for, for making decisions. Novices tend to want a lot of you know, security. I want to check that, I want to check that, I want to check that. They have different uh, translation units in the commentary process. Mind you, this is only six novices and six professionals okay. working into Danish. So we can't, we're not talking about everybody.
has also been research. If you can segment the text at phrase level, okay, and you see what that happens, when you segment at phrase level, you get much better matches. Okay, because you're looking for specific things, so there's less fuzziness about it, but you get far fewer matches. So there's a trade-off uh, and it tends not to be as effective. If people have tried other segmentation patterns. Balka, in, in really, uh, this has been important. She did it with three skewers, but it's still quite important. She um, found that when they translate with a TM and there are number errors, number mistakes, the students don't see them. And when they're in their human environment, they tend to see them. So the TM segmentation encouraged people to accept what was in the memory. You think the memory is true, even when it says 20 there and 50 there. You just don't see it, because it's authority. Okay? And uh, Rivas, who was uh, working with me at the time, um, found no correlation. <laughs> she, she was really upset. She did two experiments, found no correlation. <laughs> Uh, between the types of matches and, and area correction. Villanova, this is done with me again, looked at translation into Catalan, so this may not be of great interest to you, but she found that with a TM, in this case Trados, there, was, there were more interferences, the translations were more literal, especially in these categories, adjective plus noun qualifications, article omission, Bonus predication. And uh, remarkably enough, the last one, punctuation. Uh, in subsequent research in Barcelona, the autonomy, they've looked specifically at punctuation and they find that if people work with a TM and they've give, got a memory, they always, I mean, nobody wants to change the punctuation. They just don't think about touching the punctuation. They don't see it. Whereas, you're in a different environment, you do see punctuation and change things around. So it's really restricting your vision of the syntactic uh, units. No surprising here, exact matches are least cognitive load, no matches, great cognitive load. And the more the higher the fuzzy match, the more you've got to think about it. This is Brad or Brian, sorry. Sharon works in Dublin with eye tracking, and she's looking at pupil dilation, okay, at stress, how stressed people are. And she can look at what they do with the different degrees of fuzzy matches and travels. Okay? So, um, the lower the fuzzy match, that is, the more you have to work, but that makes sense. And then she says, but dilations increase. People get stressed, more stressed, as the fuzzy match reaches the 60, 69 level. Okay? Because, why? Because they have to figure out what's different. You know, this, trans this phrase is like the previous one, but it's got a plural, and it's got to change the article, and it's got to change the preposition, for example. Stress. And above that, decreased pupil dilation. No stress, right? It's going to give you fuzzy matches, and people look at it and say, what a lot of rubbish. No. Their eyes don't even, don't even get so I don't remember what. That is, Travos is giving them fuzzy matches that they're not even going to try to process. It's not worth worrying about. There's no stress language. It's giving too much information that their cognitive process can have. Yamada did an experiment. Yamada was here two years ago, and he's defending his doctoral thesis on this in December this year. So he set up an experiment where he gave people a very literal translation memory and then a very free translation memory. And he was trying to see, yes? What do you mean by a literal translation memory? Um, the translation memory, the pairs, were syntactically as close as possible. Japanese English. Okay? And the other translation memory sort of replaced metaphors, had syntactic reformulation, uh, far more colorful, far more, far more variation. 
And originally he wanted to see if translators learn from the translation error. You know, you'll pick up and learn new terms, new structures, uh, new types of terminological variation. So his hypothesis was this. No, this is his conclusion. He didn't find what he was looking for. He was hoping that people would get better by learning from the creative translation error. What he found, though, was that people just went a lot faster with a literal translation. Why? Because if it's in the translation memory, people think uh, it comes from a client or it comes from other translators. It's got authority. I can just accept it and move to the next piece. So, if this experiment is true over the long run, it means TMs will bring us very literal translations. Yes, and um, this is uh, Gebarov, who is again my student. Um, Anna, what are you doing? Yeah. Okay, she compared um, different kinds of memories. Some are human, uh, some are from machine translation, some are from translation memories of different degrees of fuzzy. Okay, and, and the translators just go through and translate with these different feeds. And she found that machine translation was more productive than translation methods. That people went faster and got comparable quality when they were working from machine translation feeds better than when they were working from TM feeds, again from Travis. But they're working in a standalone platform for these girls. Why? This was remarkable, because we didn't expect it. We thought machine translation would be worse. Why did she get better productivity? Simply because when the machine translation goes wrong, it goes really wrong. And people, you know, like the thing that people dimension, they don't even bother about it and they just translate. Whereas the translation memories were always a bit right. So people had to worry about detecting what had to be changed. And the conclusion of this research is, if you're going to be wrong, be really wrong. And that's what machine translation does.